In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Your brothers and sisters in Christ, beloved, beloved ones of our Lord Jesus. It's hard to write a fence. It's uncomfortable, painful, even a little risky. I don't know if you've ever tried to write a fence before, but it's not pleasant at all. It's not an enjoyable experience. Maybe if you can, if you can get yourself up there on top of that fence, you can try to keep your balance. But you can only do that balancing act for so long before what was uncomfortable becomes kind of painful. And pretty soon you're not focusing on your balance so, more, so much anymore. You start tipping this way, you start tipping that way. You try to adjust to keep yourself balanced, but it's getting more unpleasant sitting on that fence. Pretty soon you overcompensate and you either fall off the fence or you get your feet caught in the fence and you're just kind of hanging there. For good reason, people don't like to ride fences. They don't sit on fences. They climb over fences, they climb under fences, or go under fences, or cut through fences, but they don't ride fences. It's uncomfortable, it's painful, it's even a little risky. Now if we all know how uncomfortable, how painful, how risky fence riding is, why is it that you and I try so hard to be expert fence riders? I'm not talking about figuring out how to, ride a pick, how to sit on a picket fence or a barbed wire fence, but what I'm talking about is how we ride, ride fences in our lives. You could say that we've been influenced by the culture around us. Our culture around us demands compromise and tolerance and not being so judgmental and exclusive. Now, it's one thing to not be judgmental about someone from, of another race or another nationality or another culture. It's a completely different thing to not... It's a completely different thing to be cowed into thinking that if I call sin, sin, according to God's holy law, or if I speak against what is immoral in God's sight, or if I hold to the very exclusive Christ alone teaching of God's word, that I'm going to end up on the side of the fence that is intolerant, judgmental, unpopular, and will therefore bring me or make me excluded from others, ridiculed, or looked down upon. Not a single one of us wants to be in that position. We, we, don't, we don't want to be unpopular. We don't want people to exclude us. And so, we ride the fence. On the basis of your Christian faith, you may oppose what someone says or does, or what you see or hear. On the basis of God's word, you may disagree with a person's lifestyle, but you keep your mouth shut, or you look, your, or you turn your eyes away, you look away, and just keep on continuing. You keep on painfully riding that fence. Eventually, though, eventually either you fall off the fence, or you just stop objecting. On the flip side of that, your sinful nature hates the fact that you are a Christian but you don't want to let go of it. Your sinful nature just wants to go and indulge its, its cravings and its lusts and just do whatever it wants. So it has this plan. Your sinful nature plants in your head a, a foolish idea that somehow you can have both. On the one hand, why not throw yourself into enjoying the pleasures of this world? After all, you only live once. At the same time, why not keep professing that you're a Christian? It looks good in the eyes of the people on Sunday morning while you indulge your flesh during the rest of the week. What makes it all so foolish, however, is that all it is is just another way of painfully riding a fence. And you can only ride that fence so long before your Christian faith, uh, or before your Christian faith proves to be nothing more than a facade, or you just give it up altogether and indulge your sinful flesh. Because you and I so easily fall into that foolish fence-riding trap, the Apostle John's words in 1 John 2 really strike home today as he asks you and me this simple question, who do you love? You can't answer that question if you're riding a fence. So who do you love? Do you love the world? 
Or do you love the Father? John tells us, do not love the world or anything in the world. Now we're all familiar with the word love, but what's unique about that statement is the word that John uses. We don't necessarily see it in the English here, but in the original, the word that he uses is the same word that he uses when he writes, for God so loved the world. The point is, is that the love of which he speaks is in a certain sense like the love that God has for us. The love that moved him to sacrifice his one and only son to save us. It is a love that is willing to sacrifice self for the sake of another person. That takes us back to John's question. Who are you? Who do you love so much that you are willing to sacrifice yourself for or for them? Do you love this world? Are you willing to sacrifice yourself for this world, for the things of this world, for the people of this world? Now, at first, you and I would object. Of course, we don't want to. We don't want to sacrifice self for this world. I don't want to do that. But take a closer look at your life and see how much you sacrifice for the treasures, the stuff, the toys, the gadgets, the clothes, the things of this world. Not just to enjoy them, but because you want to have them so much for yourself. Or take a closer look. How much do you and I sacrifice for people of this world? People in our lives. Not, because, not just because we care about them. Which is a right and honorable thing to do. But because they have or can give something that we want, or they have taken first priority in our lives above all things, even God Himself. How much do you and I sacrifice for other things in this life? For a job, for sports, for getting ahead in life, for whatever. While your words and mine might protest against such self-sacrificing love for this world, how much you and I sacrifice for this world betrays how much we love this world. That's why the Apostle warns, if anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. You can't have both. Either you love the world or you love the Father. Either you sacrifice for this world or you sacrifice out of love for the Father who will be with you in the life to come. There really is no fence right. But you and I are quick to object, but can't I have both? Can't I love the, this world and the things of this world and still profess to follow Christ? Well, the Apostle John just shakes his head at us and says, No. In fact, everything in this world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride in one's lifestyle comes not from the Father, but from the world. Now John is not saying that the bountiful gifts that our God graciously gives to us in this life are evil. Those are gifts that God gives to us. He's no, instead, what he speaks of is what is at the heart of our sinful world, and really at the heart of our sinful natures. Cravings, lust, longing for what is not ours, and then pride and arrogance. Arrogance about what you have. Arrogance about what and what you do. Arrogance and pride in, in what kind of lifestyle you lead. He speaks against, he warns against how your sinful nature craves to indulge its lust. To indulge itself with what it sees and what it wants. And all of that is at the heart of our sinful world, of the world around us, and it's what our sinful natures completely buy into. I see it. I want it. I will do whatever it takes so that I can have it for myself, so I can enjoy it. But you know what? In just a few moments, my eyes are going to see something else or someone else, and I'm going to go after that just as hard as I did before, and I'm just going to go through this whole ridiculous cycle all over again. We started running. Uh, you start running on that hamster wheel as a child, and you keep doing it as an adult, getting nowhere and blindly chasing after what is certainly going to pass away. As John reminds us, none of that comes from the Father. Therefore, you and I can't ride the fence between loving the world and loving Him. Sadly, loving the world leaves you with nothing but emptiness. Nothing but dust and ashes, regret and guilt and death. Hence the Apostle's final warning. And the world with its lust is passing away, but the one who does God's will remains forever. Everything and everyone in this world lasts for a moment and passes away. It passes away like dust blowing in the wind. No matter who it is, no matter what it is, 
it will disappear. Someday you and I will pass away with this world and the cravings of this world. But at the end of that last warning, did you hear, did you see that small ray of hope? But the one who does God's will remains forever. As we've seen, there is no way to ride the fence when it comes to love for God and love for this world. This has to be a total commitment. It's always either or and never both and. So if love for the world comes naturally to you and me, if by nature you and I can't possibly love the Lord, how can John write what he does? How can you and I love the Father and do His will and actually remain forever? It all goes back to John's word for love. But not your love for the Father, not my love for the Father. No, it goes back to God's love for you and me through our Savior, Jesus Christ. No pun intended, but John loves to speak about God's love for you and me. Just a couple chapters after our text here, he beautifully describes God's self-sacrificing love for you and me. This is how God showed His love among us. He sent His one and only Son into the world that we might live through Him this is love, not that we love God, but that He loved us and sent His Son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Love for the Father starts, continues, and ends always with God's love for you and me through Christ Jesus. That love moved Jesus to leave the glories and comforts of heaven, to come into this sinful world of cravings and lust and arrogance, to rescue you and me from the foolish traps we got ourselves into. That love moved Jesus to go through this life fighting off the temptations of the flesh, warding off the temptations before his eyes, and crushing the shallow, foolish arrogance that comes so naturally to every one of us. Unlike us, Jesus never had, never did that. Jesus' love was never for the things of this world or for this world, but instead, Jesus' love for helpless sinners like you and me, moved him to give up everything. It moved him to sacrifice himself, to forgive the guilt of all of our sins. His love moved him to sacrifice his own life, to reconcile us with God, and to enable us, to enable us by faith to love the Father, to do his will, not to get something out of it, but to express our thanks with every last breath that God so graciously gives us day after day. That love moved Jesus to come from the Father, to give you and me pure desires to do God's will in all of our callings of life, to reveal to us His will through His Holy Word, and to purify and forgive and strengthen us through His Holy Sacraments. That love moved Him to give you and me life with Him in the glories of heaven. Not because of who we are, but simply because He loved us. He gave Himself for us. That love moved Him to live a perfect life for your sake and for mine. That love moved Him to die for us on the cross. That, loved him, that love moved Him to leave the tomb empty on the third day. And that love, because of that love of the Father through His Son, for us, well, you and I now devote our own lives to the love of the Father. To doing His will. To devoting every aspect of our lives to saying thank you for what He has done. To following Him and living for Him. Rather than chase after the cravings and lusts that, that, and things of this world that pass away. That maybe give us a brief moment of arrogant pleasure. Instead, we devote our lives in all of our callings. In the home. In church. In society, it's to serving Him. In doing so, we realize that this world and the things of this world and the cravings of this world, all of that is going to pass away someday. It's going to disappear, and we're not going to go with it. Yet what we have in Christ lasts forever. You see, a day will come when you and I and all believers in Christ are going to be with the Lord, and we're going to remain with Him in, in heaven forever. Because God showed His love to us through Jesus. There's no fence riding with that. You can't be partially committed to the world, partially committed to the Father. 
You either are, you either love the Lord, or you love the world. I pray that by faith that the Lord will place you firmly on the side of the fence, on His side of the fence, and that, and that He's with you and, and strengthens you no matter what the world thinks about you being on that side of the fence. I pray that the Lord will guide your desires and thoughts and actions to do His will, not for your sake, but to respond, to, to say thank you for the love He's shown to you. I pray that He will, he will guide you and that he will, and that He will keep you with Himself, that you will remain faithful to Him, committed to the Savior God who loves you, who gave everything for you, and with whom you will remain forever in the glories of heaven.